So, uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us now. Um, to reintroduce ourselves. Yes, I'm Agustina Vergara Sid, and I'm a junior fellow here at the Ayn Rand Institute. And I'm joined by uh, Elan Giorno, who is a fellow and director of policy research here at the Institute. Um, so today marks the 17th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, and this is what we're going to be discussing today. Um, so Elan, 9-11 is now a fading memory for those who were old enough to actually be aware of it. And I'm sure that much of our audience uh, wasn't old enough to really understand what was happening at the time. So can you help us uh, understand the road to 9-11? Yeah, I think it's a really important issue for people to grapple with and think about because we're still living with the effects of 9-11 and, and the, the response to it. The road to 9-11, which I talk about in this book, Winning the Unwinnable War, um, from a few years back, it has to be understood as a failure of policy and moral thinking. And it's a failure of policy in the sense that although people talk about the intelligence agencies not seeing the signals, I think the signals were there and I think they saw them. What they didn't see and what the political uh, establishment didn't understand is how to put all those dots together. So there were a series of attacks over the decades by members of the Islamist movement that includes regimes like Iran, Saudi Arabia, m groups that are famous now like Al-Qaeda, which was behind the specific attack on 9-11. And what the failure was to see that all of them are motivated by the same goals. And this is an ideological movement deeply rooted in Islam. I call it in the books, we call it um, Islamic totalitarianism. So there was a kind of blind spot. So we saw all these dots and we tr sort of the, the response to it was let's treat them as uh, as uh, isolated terrorist incidents. And we dealt with them to the extent we dealt with them, but it, there was no conception that these people are declared war. We have to take seriously that although they're not materially very strong, they mean to carry out real uh, harm and do damage. So that was a kind of political failure and a, a failure to think philosophically and to understand the fundamentals of this movement. And what happened was 9-11 happened, was, was a catastrophic attack and it came as a surprise, and in a way, it should not have been a surprise that people were watching this, mm -hmm. um, because this movement, the, the leaders of this movement told us what they were planning to do in broad terms, not the specific attack, but the idea of bringing down the infidel regimes and attacking countries and, move, and, and governments that they thought were impious. They told us all this. We didn't take seriously, we didn't take seriously the idea that they're driven by a philosophic vision. It's it's a perverse and corrupt vision, but that's still what animates them, and that explains their behavior. And it, it's something we completely ignored and, and missed in the run-up to 9-11. I see. Now, the, the, what compounded the, the tragedy, I think, is that um, in the response to 9-11, there was similar kind of thinking. Uh, not really clarity about what this movement is about, what they're trying to do, nor what the targets should be. So, you know, one of the things we argued right at, right after 9/11 is that to, if you understand the nature of this enemy, you have to understand that um, Iran was central to it. It's not the only regime that was part of this movement, but it was central to it, and it would be a it should be a high target, if not the first and the second. And in fact, what happened? America's policy was sabotaged by the ideas that shaped it, and that was we didn't understand who we're fighting against. Um, the Bush administration ended up justifying its war in Iraq and Afghanistan on the, on the grounds of bringing democracy to the Middle East. And that, in our view, was a self-sacrificial goal, self -sacrificial goal really subversive of America's interests. And that was a significant causal factor for understanding why Iraq and Afghanistan are now, they're, they're bywords for quagmire, right? They're the new Vietnam, in effect, that they're seen as failures. And in a fundamental sense, they are. But again, they're not military failures, because militarily I think America is incredibly powerful and it could have defeated these threats long ago. They're policy failures, they're moral failures in the sense of how we think about the problem, how we, what we think we're allowed to do morally, what, what we think we have a right to do, which we didn't feel we could defeat them in that term. That makes sense. Um, you mentioned policy failures. Um, and I think about a recent uh, New York Times op-ed that claims that the Trump administration is willing to open direct talks with the Afghan Taliban, 
uh, to encourage them to initiate uh, talks between between them and the and the Afghan government, and America in this case would act as a broker between the two parties. Um, so, in the article praises this initiative and claims that talks with the Taliban is the only way to stabilize Afghanistan and to uh, prevent it from reverting to a safe haven for terrorists to conduct further attacks to against America. Uh, what is your take on this argument? Do you think that it's right and it is practical to talk to the Taliban? No, I, I regard that as a, a confession of complete failure. So if, you're, if people look back through the news articles, if you look at some of the video uh, statements that were put out at the time, there was a real sense, and I think people were right to demand this, that we were going to go after the regime that harbored al-Qaeda in planning these attacks. And we would defeat them, and we'd defeat al-Qaeda, and then maybe there was more work to do. And people, I think, rightly saw this as a, an achievable goal, and it was achievable. Um, the idea that from we're going to defeat them 17 years ago to today, we are accepting the fact that they've reconquered a lot of the territory. They're not the only Islamists in Afghanistan. They're vying with factions of the Islamic State that's still left over. And they have part of the country, so they're, they're undefeated. To me, that's a confession of a, uh, we really didn't know what we were doing. And the idea that we would sink to the level of, can we negotiate with them? Would their word, can we trust their word? That is ridiculous to assume that they're a legitimate uh, uh, regime to negotiate with and that there's any, any sense in trying to cut a deal with these people. They need to be defeated and I think we can defeat them if we change the, the premises we fight on. Um, so to me, and it, 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 the sad part, the doubly sad part of this is that Afghanistan was, a, was I think, rightly seen as a necessary first step in responding to 9-11 because that's where al-Qaeda was based mm -hmm. and it was a real, uh, unlike Iraq, which was way more controversial, I think it was not the right war to go after. Um, and here, it, 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 to me, it illustrates a theme that we've been writing and talking about for many years, which is the Islamist movement in al-Qaeda and, and the Taliban in particular are materially very weak. Like if you think of their military strength, they don't have navies, they don't have air forces, they have some old weapons and improvised explosive devices. But what they have that we don't is a kind of strong morale, a real commitment to their goals, and a belief that they're winning. And we've let them feel that we're through our um, failed policies in the region. So we've encouraged them in the belief that they're going to, and, and this kind of thing, this, this policy of trying to negotiate with them, which is which is not new to the Trump administration. This has been knocking mm -hmm. around. It was popular under Obama, and even during Bush, there were people advocating for this. The idea that this is now the solution is reverting to pre-9-11 thinking and, the, and just not really taking seriously any of the lessons that we should have learned from the time that's passed. That makes sense. And there are many arguments about what the approach should be from uh, the perspective of American policy towards this issue. And there's another argument that it's uh, that claims that, unlike what many politicians say, uh, terrorism does not pose an existential threat to the United States. And this is based on the very low numbers of deaths that occur on the hands of terrorists and the very low number of terrorist attacks that, act, that are actually carried out nowadays. Uh, and therefore, this argument goes uh, goes on to say that uh, the government should not spend as many resources and time as it is spending nowadays on counterterrorism. Uh, what is your take on this argument, and what do you think it really is the threat of Islamic terrorism nowadays? Yeah, so I have a lot to say on this. I'm actually writing an article for our, our online publication, New Ideal, mm -hmm. on this subject. So I'll have more to say. Uh, what I'll share now is. I think there are a number of mistakes in this view, but it's important to see why it's it's uh, appealing to people, why they find it, um, con if not convincing, at least persuasive. And I think the big one is precisely because the responses to 9-11 in, in Iraq and Afghanistan did not go the way they were supposed to. They, they were actually failures, and people don't understand why they were failures. They, they view them as military failures, and I think that's a mistake. 
their failures of how we conducted the war and the goals we set. The goals were not legitimate goals. It's not right to go and nation build. It was not our, we don't have a responsibility to bring democracy uh, to the rest of the world the way George W. Bush thought. Now, all of those goals really corrupted the military venture and they, they, they skewed the priorities. And in effect, they meant not defeating whatever threat we face, but just nation building, which is entirely the wrong thing. People don't understand that fully, but what they do understand is all those American lives lost in fighting in those two conflicts, all the money that was spent, and, and for what, right? It doesn't, nothing has been accomplished. So I think part of the sympathy for it is, well, if that's what it means to respond to terrorism, who wants that, right? No, nobody wants another Iraq, which is part of the, what makes that tragic is that that's not at all what it looks like to respond to the terrorism threat. Well, this, uh, more correctly, the Islamist threat. Um, terrorism is just their means, uh, one that they favor. So that's one of the mistakes in this view, is to think of them as primarily terrorists, to think that responding to them means these quagmire-style wars like Afghanistan and Iraq. And then the second thing that is worth thinking about here is that if you take seriously that the Islamists are moved by an ideology, I think that's the essential nature of this threat, then you have to see that not stopping them, not um, uh, preventing them or eliminating them or defeating them means that they feel they can keep going and they will keep going because they're after a particular goal, a vision of society that they believe is the right vision, the idea of Islamic law ruling everybody. That's very different from, say, falling in the bathtub, which is one of the statistics people often use in these conversations. Yes. Like, you know, more people die from uh, falling in the bathtub or drowning in the bathtub than do from uh, Islamist terrorist attacks per year if you, if you run the numbers. Mm -hmm. But there's something fundamentally different between an accident and people committing acts that are evil. Like they're, they're, yes. they're trying to destroy human lives and they're using whatever knowledge and skills they have to, to accomplish those goals. Now, it's, it's also true that this threat, I don't think it's right to think of the threat as existential. And by that, people usually understand something like, if you go back to the Cold War or World War II, the kinds of enemies we faced in, in Nazi Germany or Japan or in the Cold War, the Soviet bloc, militarily, they were really powerful. There, you know, there was an arms race, and that meant that between the US and the, and the Soviet bloc, we were trying to keep up with each other in terms of military capability. There's nothing remotely like that mm -hmm. with the Islamist threat. If you add it all up, uh, including all the regimes that are, are spearheading this movement. But the fact that it's, but I think it's wrong to take as a premise that only if it's existential is, does that justify doing something. Because there are lots of threats in life that are not existential, but that you still have to do something about. Yeah. Um, and in this case, if you take seriously the idea that they're moved by ideas and that this is, this is a key to understanding what they're doing, then inaction is in effect an encouragement to them and not only that it, it, it means that they have time and, and space to think and carry out more attacks so it, it might not be as colossal a threat as the Soviet Union was that's that's true um, and responding to it does not look like Afghanistan or Iraq but you still have to do something and it is a threat uh, I think what we've seen is that there there's, a, there's both morale which is very high among them you saw that with the tens of thousands of people who flocked to live and fight for ISIS when it was still a going concern. That should be surprising, but to me, it, it reveals that the movement really attracts people because of its ideology. If you understand that, you know you have to fight this enemy. So I, the, the whole idea of looking at this uh, in comparison to domestic accidents or even um, uh, car crashes or, or that kind of thing, I, I don't think it's the right way to view it, and there's a lot of uh, false assumptions in that, though I understand people's frustration, because I, I share it. I think no, if you told me we're going to respond to this threat and we're going to do another Iraq, I would say no, that would be a mistake. So uh, I think it is a threat that still looms over us in an important way, and its impact on us isn't fully recognized by people, because I think it isn't just in the way in which it's killing people through terrorist attacks. There's lots of ways, and that's part of what I try to do in these two books, um, Winning the Unwinnable War here and Failing to Confront Islamic Totalitarianism, which I recommend people have a look at. You can read excerpts online. Part of what we try to show is that th this movement has had a significant impact already 
And so long as we don't understand it, as long as we don't really defeat it, it's going to continue being a threat that we need to confront. Mm -hmm. That's a very rational perspective, and I look forward to reading your article on New Ideal. Thank and you. that brings us to our last question for today. What has been ARI's approach over the years on the issue of terrorism in general and 9 11 in particular? Yeah, so I'll say briefly the best way to, to get a flavor of that is to look through these two books, which I mentioned, and, and some of the articles we've published on New Ideal and on the Institute's website, and we'll link to them uh, underneath this video. Um, I would say the essential thing is. We take seriously the ideas that animate this movement, this Islamist movement. We recognize that it is a movement, and we recognize that it's in America's rational self-interest to defeat this threat, and it's achievable. We can do that. What it, what's a big part of what's been missing, we've argued, is the moral confidence to do that, the sort of self-esteem to think we have a right to do it, and, and then act on that in a way that's consistent with the principles of a free society. Well, that concludes our uh, discussion for today. Thank you so much, Elena, for Thanks. bringing clarity to this issue. And to our audience, I, if, if you want to gain more clarity and understand this issue better, I recommend you grab a copy of Winning the Unwinnable War and Failing to Confront Islamic Totalitarianism, both available on Amazon. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.